Yeah. Oh, we're officially live. Ah. Yeah. Live on YouTube. Poo, poo. Sorry, I'm a bit immature. So immature, Dan. <laughs> now Thank Simon's going to have to edit that. I might just do a quick quick race to the um, little boys' room now that it's live and I can state that. Um, I'll be back in just a few okay. seconds. Good one. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let's please up down me. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Alex. Hey, how's everyone? Oh, all right, mate. How are you doing? Not too bad. Surviving, surviving. <laughs> yeah. Are you um? Are you knee deep in marking yet? More than knee deep, but yeah, I'm trying not to think about it. This is a nice distraction, to be honest. Sorry about sorry about that. During the distraction, what did I bring up? Yeah, I'm trying not to think about it either. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's so much, one for me. So much to do. <laughs> mm. Hey, Laurie. All right. Uh, okay, so I've um, got us um, on. Um, sorry, I can't speak either. Why can't I speak? I'm not the one who's waking up at four o'clock. <laughs> um, uh, which, yeah, we're live on YouTube, but it's embedded in the website. So I've done half of the things that I need to do. Um, uh, so. Um, Ricardo, I'm just going to take your video off. Um, yep. It's fine. Hi. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are we ready to kick off? I mean, people can um, still. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Still roll in. Um, yeah. Can I, can I ask everyone who's not. Dan, Dan, and Christina to uh, switch their mics off, um, and and cameras off as well. And cameras off as well. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty much it. Okay, right. Let's get the recording happening. Hey, and uh, welcome <laughs> to this the. Fifth session of the EASPM London Calling 2020 online conference, and um, now all the things that I've got to mention. Okay, so we're starting off with uh, Christina Kelman's um, keynote on personal transformation through entrepreneurial and international real world learning, and um, and she's joined by uh, Dan Pratt and Danny Hagen from UWL. Sorry, Christina is from. Queensland University of Technology and um, we'll be uh, doing kind of roughly an hour um, and then questions and then around 7.30 depending how we go there is a 25 minute concert and then uh, later on this evening at 9.30 all the papers go live so the nine new papers uh, <laughs> Juan Pablo. Welcome. <laughs> um, right. Um, and uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that on Thursday, some of you, well, hopefully you all have at least heard about the fact that we're running a Twitter listening party, uh, hashtag London listening 2020. 
where we'll be listening to um, RTJ for uh, the Run the Jewels album the, um, and live tweeting about it. Yeah, we don't know what it's going to be quite yet, but it'll be exciting and interesting. So <laughs> that's all right. My problem. No, no problem. Um, so I am going to uh, switch. I was going to say. Also, Thursday, 11 a.m., is that oh. Christina's going to be doing a book launch as well um, because she wrote a book. And and we're going to be talking We're going to be talking <laughs> a little bit about that tonight, but uh, we're really going to leave that more to um, a more reasonable time for Christina. For those of you that don't know this, it's, two, it's 3 a.m. in Australia right now, is it? It's yeah. 3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't done this kind of rock and roll style lecture before so we'll see how we go <laughs> great so i'll be i'll be sending out the zoom details for the book launch meeting which will be morning uk time um a bit um anti-social for the americans but um but more sociable for the australians and so we're um we're equal opportunity um, on the X <laughs> here. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna leave you to it and um, switch myself off. Great, thanks, Simon. All right, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Kelman, who's a senior lecturer at Queensland University of Technology and my personal good friend, also, Christina was part of the supervision team for my PhD. So clearly I'm always in, I think it's uh, the supervisor student relationship always with us as well. We've been, we've been very close for a number of years. Um, today, yes, today we're going to be discussing a lot of um, Christina's learning style, the educational model she builds up. Um, we're going to talk about international learning, high school learning. Um, but you know what? Let, let's just dive straight into it. Um, Christina, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Dan. And um, I did actually put some notes together because it's 3 a.m. and who knows how my brain will operate over the next hour and a half, but hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully. And just, just reel me in when I start rambling. Oh, of course, of course. And we have the uh, delightful Danny Hagen <laughs> in with us as well, who's going to be a part of the panel. Yeah. Hey, Danny. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thank you, Dan. All right, you've you've got the kind of the silhouette of mystery around you there. Absolutely, yes, yes. <laughs> long, long earned. Um. <laughs> so, um, I guess probably a, a really good place to start is um, thinking about how being a musician influences the way you operate as a pedagogist, as a as a teacher in both high school work and in university work. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I kind of always like to talk to my students about, you know, when I was a student and I graduated from my first degree in music in the early 90s and came out of that degree really proficient and well skilled up in on my instrument and my voice. I uh, got out of uni and and I'm like, OK, what now? <laughs> and, you know, I, I kind of realized pretty quickly that the phone uh, wasn't necessarily just going to ring. And I mean, the phone on the wall with the cord, um, that was just not really going to happen. And, and having always been quite a social and a, a sociable person with fairly good interpersonal skills, I think, um, I was pretty conscious about leveraging the connections that I'd made throughout my time at uni. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a high school teacher, but I also knew I wanted to balance that with a career in as a professional musician. And I've been really um, lucky to have sustained a kind of portfolio career where I've been able to conduct ensembles and direct theatre productions and um, teach and record and perform. So it's um, something that's really uh, close to my heart when I, as a teacher, is trying to make that a reality for my students. Because as we know, especially in high school music curricula, we're really focused on disciplinary knowledge and we're not necessarily even thinking about the realities of 
the uh, of the world that they're going to kind of one day inhabit. So, yeah. So for me, it's I I think it needs to start right back in the schooling years that it's not just about the disciplinary knowledge; it's about that street smart music industry kind of know-how and personal connections. It, it needs to start right back then. <laughs> So that's yeah. kind of where I come from, I guess. Christine, if I could uh, say, having looked at a lot of your work over the years, you seem to make fun or enjoy enjoyment a big part of your teaching style. I'm just wondering how important that is to you in the sort of teacher-student relationship. Yeah, well, I think it's fun. <laughs> I <laughs> don't know how my students feel about it. Um, I guess... Um, um, is, is it okay if I just quickly give a little bit of backstory? Um, yes, please. I, um, thanks. I, I was employed um, to, to set up the music program at a new creative industries high school in Brisbane, where I'm from. Um, and the, I guess the vision of the school was that it wasn't going to just be a performing arts school, but it was going to be entrepreneurial and enterprising and um, industry facing. And of course, you get into a school and that vision starts to kind of take the back seat because, you know, we're, we're working in a school with a very um, academic, rigorous international curriculum. And so the focus then becomes on the assessment and the external exams, leaving very little time for anything else. Um, I had, we had attracted a lot of interesting students to this school who were already writing songs, recording, um, doing gigs and they came to the school to get to that next level um, and of course I was really quite afraid that we were going to lose students when they kind of came to the school and said well now we're going to study a Purcell opera for the next two years and <laughs> learn everything note for note. So um, I found an article in a newspaper um, and a young 16 year old girl was complaining about the lack of opportunities for young musicians and young audiences to kind of come together and build their own youth scene. Um, and and I, I essentially I took that um, newspaper article to this group of students and said, well, here you go, here's your challenge. And, and I invited them basically to start their own music business venture, um, which is what they did. And they called themselves Youth Music Industries. Why am I? Um, and what this basically meant was that my students were interested in creating opportunities for other musicians to record, to perform, to get live, yeah, to get live performance experience, to network, to uh, interface with the industry through these kind of big events. So they ran like a, um, a monthly uh, band venue, um, like a club. Um, I was getting like a couple of hundred people at it at one stage, a 12 hour four stage music uh, music festival annually. Um, they piggybacked um, the Big Sound Conference, which happens in Australia each year and started the Little Big Sound Conference. Um, so, yeah, and, and then they sort of toured their, their events and their opportunities for young people all over Queensland. So, um, it was a really important opportunity, I thought, <laughs> that I thought for, for my music students to understand the promotional, financial, um, organisational and event manage managerial aspects of the music industry. Um, oh. So hopefully um, they could potentially have, have a better chance at managing their own entrepreneurial careers or even maybe find another kind of equally satisfying creative career amongst all of that. Um, so, yeah, and, and what it did was it kind of gave them an opportunity to have fun, but to also experience the frustrations <laughs> that, that people on the other side of the fence experience, mm. the highs, the lows, the rewards, the challenges, um, the risks, that's a big one. But yeah, the hard work and the fun. So We've Dan, got, maybe yeah. you could show oh. a little snippet of my high school guys. Oh, damn it. <laughs> of course it didn't work. <laughs> and they're always putting their own videos together. And... 
really good job at promoting themselves. But I, I guess what I wanted you to notice about in this little video is the sense of community that they were building. There's Matt Corby. So Christina, where, where um, you described the students kind of leading and getting hands-on experience, where's the educator fits in that model when the students are really driving their own learning? Sorry, sorry, Dan, it broke up a little bit there. Sorry, just running where, where the students get all this fantastic hands-on experience and learning all the highs and lows by, by doing, where does the educator yeah. fits in that, uh, in that model? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, I, I'm pretty honest about it in my book. It's, uh, it's uh, the educator has to be extremely entrepreneurial um, and willing to take some serious risks. Um, but my job, I guess, is to, is to kind of stay out of it as much as possible, but to make sure that I'm observing the learning and, uh, and kind of getting in there and meddling a bit and engineering or planting seeds <laughs> that would kind of create a command to need to know something, a demand, I should say, a demand to need to know something. I think students are really driven to learn when they, they know that they need to learn something and it's relevant. So mm. I, I, I guess that's kind of where I position myself, more as that meddler. <laughs> um. Uh, to take to take this opportunity so a lot of these um early youth projects are what you based your book on um so and we'll, we'll you know we'll go into a full book plug mode on thursday morning but um at at the moment um we we were going to kind of dig into the model that you sort of built around this the pedagogical model that you built mm -hmm. around this and i'm just going to bring into my share screen and this time it's going to work perfectly um and we'll just have a quick look at that and a bit of a talk if you could give us a bit of a talk through how you set up your pedagogical model yeah i was thinking about this this afternoon i i'd, I'd like to start by kind of saying that the pedagogical approach is student driven um, because it recognizes that students have an enormous amount of social capital that can be leveraged uh, for learning and opportunities and as i was just saying to danny engineering those environments that actually give the students an opportunity to understand how to do that in the first place. Um, any adaptation of social capital theory recognizes young people as agents in transforming their own education and lives, not simply as inheritors of their parents' status. So, I mean, if you take, for example, the 2018 uh, youth-led climate change protests, um, as an example, um, you know, if you, we, we consider that there was so much concern about um, teenage apathy <laughs> when the internet kind of came about. Um, however, I thought the climate change protest is a perfect example of young people being active citizens using their social networks to make change. So, um, and, and I guess the other thing about youth agency or social capital in youth is that you, you we need to consider that it, it you can't build it without having a sense of belonging so any type of learning environment that's i guess community focused needs to make sure that the members of that con learning community are valued and legitimated not passive and peripheral and a lot of traditional i guess it still happens today in classrooms the teacher teaches and the student learns um and it's quite a passive, a passive approach. Um, this model is the complete opposite of that. We're all we're all learning as we go, including myself. Um, okay, so that this model. Um, um, so just to also put up front, this is this has come out of a long study where I looked at what the students 
in YMI were learning and how they were learning it over about a four year period. Um, so for example, I analyzed over 4,000 Facebook meeting posts <laughs> and, um, and then followed up with interviews to clar for clarification at certain times. Um, I really wanted to understand what they were learning, how they were learning it. And I used these entrepreneurial competencies um, that were first um, kind of framed by Johannesson in 1991 as these kind of knowing competencies, know why is your personal motivation and um, your understanding, your attributes, um, your personal attributes and qualities, know what is kind of your, your discipline or domain knowledge, know how are the skills you need to apply um, to execute entrepreneurial ventures, know when is that kind of ability to understand timing and opportunity recognition and know who is obviously your social capital, your understanding uh, who's in your networks close and far. Um, so <laughs> communities of practice and social capital for me, social capital builds community of practice and community of practice enables social capital. So the two work in tandem. Um, in the first phase, um, when the students first came together in their community of practice, we used the expression, uh, the three types of capital um, coined by Robert Putnam, the author of Bowling Alone, um, as bonding, bridging and linking capital. So bonding capital is, so what, what we know is that, that, that individuals have a regular strong ties and they're good for building a, a community, building a strong sense of shared purpose. But it's the, the weaker ties, which we have many of them, but they're harder to, they're harder to access. Um, and yeah, and that, but you need that in order to, to execute entrepreneurialism. Sorry, um, could you, so could in you that clarify first, weaker ties a little bit there? Like, yeah. for example, we, yeah. um, so weaker ties, are, are the ties that, are. I, I, I mean, Granovetta talks about this in his theory, the strength of weak ties. They are the connections of your connections of your connections. So mm -hmm. they are, they're harder to access. But if you can, the potential in those networks for innovation, for learning new perspectives, for um, learning new knowledge, um, that just the potential to access different new resources is far greater. If you um, only sort of operate with your strong bonding ties, basically um, the group can become hostage to itself into its own evolution. It, it becomes stagnant it um it yeah it just it, it it can't evolve and it limits its access to what what else what else is out there does that is that yeah so it's like you get stuck in phase one if you don't explore those ties properly <laughs> exactly exactly so um so that's basically phase one but it's a really important phase because the students need to know who's good at what who can do what who uh what skills people have um who knows who um, it, it's a time to build their repertoire. So not only their kind of artifacts, but their procedural repertoire, like how they're going to communicate, how they're going to maintain um, a good a good working environment, how they're going to negotiate meaning, how they're going to resolve conflict, um, <laughs> how they're going to set their tasks and complete them. So all of that stuff needs to happen in phase one and of course you're going to rely on your immediate networks to get things off the ground so you start with your, your gigs are going to be small and your friends and your family come but by phase two we're looking at what we call imagining communities of practice it's that starting to think bigger than bigger than yourself and um and to do that you need bridging capital so you need to be exposed to other practices and other communities it's a scary place to be on that periphery um, because um, it, yeah, because you don't know you don't know what you, what you're going to have to to learn or to execute at that point. So um, for for me as the educator, in to get that phase, I've got to introduce the students to industry networks and actually instigate projects. So it's not the industry mentoring the kids; it's them working together on projects, collab actual collaborating. 
Um, and then in phase three, this is when communities of practice are aligning. It means that they've kind of developed their processes so, so much that their learning is now effective. It's grounded their learning and it's, it's, it's in full flow and it's operating and it aligns with other institutional processes doesn't mean that it's lost its creativity and its vibrance and, and it's following the rules. It just means that it knows how to, how to operate in the broader social system. And the linking capital is being able to connect with, <laughs> with government, with local politicians, with industry, um, with the school principal, knowing how to kind of, how to best operate those, or best um, manage those type and maintain those types of connections. And for me, that's when they're professional, <laughs> when they get to that professional level. But as you can see, my phases are all transparent, which means that, you know, you could be in phase three, but a whole new ball game has been thrown at you and all of a sudden you're back in phase one. So you can be in phase one and phase three at the same time. And I guess that emphasizes this idea that we're always learners. We're always <laughs> lifelong learners. We're always students. Yeah, I, I do. I do find. Oh, sorry, that was probably very long winded. <laughs> um, I do. I I do find it kind of fat. I like the transparency idea because a, a lot of cognitive models usually involve <clears> some <throat> form of looping, sort of looping back and requestioning and then coming back to it. But in this case, it's a it's a question of you can be in phase three and phase one or phase three and phase two at the same time. So it's not yeah. not not necessarily that you're looping back to the start. It's you're you're existing in parallel states. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not very good at designing things, but that was the best way that I felt that I could kind of <laughs> capture that. Christina, <laughs> <laughs> um, can I can I um, just bring you back to the educator again? Just you know, you've described sort of um, yeah. various meddling and mentoring and sort of uh, various other uh, ways of acting. I'm just wondering in that in that model, what what's involved for you as an educator to sort of, sort of to navigate between those phases and how what's what kind of um, processes you you bring to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in the first phase, it's working really closely with the students and kind of leading them. By phase two, I took a complete step back because I wanted them to to go crazy. <laughs> and I in, I'm in the background, working in the background, kind of fostering these partnerships and these new kind of opportunities that I could bring to the table um and then by phase three i came back into the group as an equal member um and felt very much like an equal member <laughs> like i was on the same kind of playing field um as the students so yeah it, and it was a very there were very conscious decisions on my part um yeah so did you did you you contemplate the students fail perhaps in phase two was that part of it oh the... totally <laughs> in fact you know i also have to be very honest about this in the book i've got these little honesty boxes in my book <laughs> like there were a lot of risks taken you know mm. especially in phase two like there's an a beautiful example of a student um using a piece of music on top of a promotional video, but not for, not getting the right permissions and the band manager contacting the <laughs> students and, a, and, whew, and it could have become a quite a serious situation, but um, thankfully <laughs> we, we, ha we had a supportive kind of um, cluster of people around the students, but um, that that's the thing. I could have brought um, the copy of the local, you know, um, APRA AMCOS into, into the school to do a, a formal talk on copyright, but this was the best way for them to actually learn yeah. about it and, nev and never get that wrong again. Sorry, just to translate and that then... for the UK people, that's PRS. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, yeah well, for, I think you've got some examples here about, your, um, about the learning that the students are doing here. Um, obviously, they did it just like students. Um, this is from a Facebook excerpt. I... Yep. Um, so we've got Hayden saying, holy shit, re... they're lazy. No wonder bands need managers. <laughs> um, is, is, is that the sort of education we're I talking mean... about? <laughs> well, I mean, 
they came to that realization themselves and it's a really significant learning for them as musicians because you know here they are musicians on the other side of the fence with with bands not returning emails um and you know they've got a festival coming up they haven't got any of the information about technical stuff that they need and holy shit they're lazy no wonder they need managers it's a beautiful realization and in fact there's an interview with that with um hayden a little bit later on in the book where he talks about the fact that now i know with my band how important it is to maintain professionalism because you know if you if if you get on the wrong side of this people, you get blacklisted and you know it was a, a really he really understood yeah and you I, you can't teach that you can you can tell students you've got to be professionally going to answer emails but until you've experienced it <laughs> i don't think yeah yeah of course anyway. um, so, <laughs> so would, would you say that that uh that events particularly lend themselves to to, to creating learning outcomes yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that's a really interesting point because kind of building or designing any learning environment, the students have to feel a real sense of ownership and um, it's got to be real and useful and meaningful. Um, and, you know, you can simulate experiences, but students don't really buy into it. <laughs> they, they, you know, they want something that's authentic and um, that, that they yeah, have a really strong sense of ownership. I think um, if, if, have I got any other notes on that? Um, no, no I, I look, I think, um, I think that's it. You know, they just, um, they just want to, to understand what is going to be useful and relevant to them in building their own careers. So yeah, the event thing is, is, is the real thing. Mm. They, at the time, they believed that life, performance opportunities were everything <laughs> and getting that experience like getting playing on a festival um with some of australia's biggest names i mean they 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 negotiated with matt corby for a thousand dollars um <laughs> you know it was an incredible thing that they just had this wonderful intuitive sense of artists and bands that were going to just break it so we we had big enough artists to big build to bring big crowds but at the same time, all these youth artists got to play, got their names, or, you know, on the same bill. And for them, that was, that was everything. You know? mm. yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah. So moving, moving from yeah. high school to university yeah. and sticking with events-based things, um, this is where we sort, sort yeah. of start pushing into what was the precursor to what we're really here to talk about, which is India. But before we, <laughs> before we before we talk about India, let's um let's have a chat a little bit about the QUT Indy One Hundred project because this was yeah, kind of sure. the embryo of the thing that later became India. Yeah. So why I really resonated with this Indy One Hundred project that existed before I came to QUT was that again it was student a very very largely student driven and industry facing, um, and so my own pedagogical philosophy or approach was kind of felt it felt right like I had a real match with this project so at the Indy 100 um, basically uh, the easiest way to explain it it's a large-scale recording event it's like recording a hundred local artists from around Queensland uh, southeast Queensland in a hundred hours so over six years that's 600 songs that have gone up and out um, and still generating streaming um, revenue today. Um, and what it did was it kind of provided a living history of the Brisbane music scene. And as a research project, it wanted to really understand how, how um, independent artists were sort of sustaining themselves. Mm. Um, so that's essentially what the project was. And, and the wonderful thing that I loved about it was that students had the opportunity to run the event, promote the event, do the marketing, do the digital distribution stuff, um, and event and event managed like this complex, large scale coordinated coordination nightmare. <laughs> to um to <laughs> but jump it's in. a really and oh and can can I just add one yes, thing? Oh, sorry, yeah. Um the the early the early designers of this project, Phil Graham and Andy Arthurs, 
they talk about the fact that what it does is if you consider higher education kind of like the upper ground and um, the local music scene as the underground, then how do you bring those two disparate elements together? You do it through the Indy 100 acting as this kind of intermediary or middle ground. So I really love that, that idea of higher education being kind of this cool, useful um, industry embedded, community embedded um, player mm. and not this, you know, far off kind of, you know, academic dream out of reach of a lot of a lot of young people who wouldn't if ever think that they could find a place within a university um this kind of changes that that playing field a lot i think and just to talk a little bit about the scale of this it, the, um i i helped on the indy 100 participate as a producer and artist and um helped with some of the organizing but it's um yeah it's really hard to explain how one studio yeah. with five rooms in it had a hundred artists go through it in five days. And that happened every year and produced, you know, nearly 700 songs over seven years. Um, it It's hard to explain what it felt like to be inside that melting pot yeah. as it was happening. Um, it's, so it's kind of one of those really exciting educational experiences, I think not just for students, but for teachers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, also we should mention that industry were largely involved as well, um, not only from a, they, they actually were responsible for selecting the top 12 acts from each 100 each year to, to go into a kind of official album and, um, and, and also um, in, in terms of the, distrib in, uh, the distribution deal and mm. so on so yeah so it brought industry higher ed and local together great and that mm. and then this kind of um i guess we kind of take that idea and then a chance meeting with sonia um and mm -hmm. some other friends adam as well um and maybe we can start that little bit of story as to how india evolved out of that yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, I had, as, as you just said, I had this uh, lovely meeting in Brisbane with the CEO of an, an industry organisation in Chennai, India, Sonia Mazunda. Uh, she's the CEO of an industry organisation called EarthSync and they run like a big sound type, type of like the Indian Ocean's version of South by Southwest industry conference, trade show, showcase to international buyers in Chennai and I had a wonderful meeting with her and was just talking about you know my high school project and Indy 100 and she she basically said I would love for you for us to try something like that in India because her organization supports independent artists musicians and filmmakers um, because they need support because uh, the dominant, obviously, the dominant industry in India is the Bollywood industry, film music industry, um, and her organisation supports anything outside of that mainstream. Um, so uh, she felt that you know models like this would do a, would be useful in unearthing and promoting and showcasing and um, collaborating internationally and yeah. Great. So was there any other sort of thing about India that tragedy was it just just a chance meeting that um, that, that kicked it off? Um, well, I, I mean, I guess I, I guess through her, I, I get I got to learn a little bit about this unique scene um, in India. Um, and I guess the thing that struck me the most was the scene is only about 30 years old, um, maybe a bit more. Um, be, uh, <laughs> And yeah, and, and so, um, excuse me, I'm having a 3 a.m. moment. Um, so the scene is only about 30 years old and it has, it really lacks the kind of infrastructure that we, um, the music industry scaffolding or infrastructure that we kind of take for granted in the West. Um, for example, no, it's not really a common thing to, um, 
to have live music venues. I mean, from state to state, there's such different regulations. And India's never, you know, for familial and societal expectations of young people, there's it, there's no such thing as a kind of going out to hear bands and drinking kind of <laughs> culture. So, um, yeah, it, it's that whole idea that <laughs> there's just kind of nothing to hold this thing up that people want to do was kind of really interesting to but me. But there's a, there's a huge youth culture and a big mobile network there, right? Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing is that at the moment in India, 50% of the population is... A, under the age of 30 so <laughs> there's this huge culture shift um not only that um you know when um Singh's liberalizing reforms happened in the early 90s in India um it meant access to well first of all it meant huge economic growth and the rise of of this middle class which meant that that uh this middle class tended to be more western leaning and the, the numbers of students that started to attend university just grew and grew. And then, of course, here at their universities and their colleges, they were exposed to Western popular music. And so um, all this kind of informal learning started happening and people started kind of forming bands and teaching each other how to play guitar and bass. And, um, and they started playing covers. And then the colleges and the universities, so this is like engineering college, medical college, business college, they started to, to realise that, well, there's no real live music venues in India. And so colleges started these big things called college festivals and they're huge. They're, you know, some of these festivals are, you know, sponsored by Red Bull and telephone companies and the whole thing. Um, and bands started playing at these festivals, mostly covers, um, Rock Street Journal kind of turned up in the 90s and really kind of started to emphasise this, this, this growing rock scene. Um, and then it became a requirement that at these college festivals you had to play original music. And so th this is kind of how, how the thing really started, I guess. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm really interested in, in the notion of the Indian independent um, music. Just just if you could sort of yeah. give a bit more sense of what, what it means. I mean, Fonro talks about independence being like a set of principles you know about values for the community and i just wonder if you could perhaps tell us more about what those sort of values you think maybe um are for the for the, for the young people involved in the indie movement yeah sure well i think um in, in good thing to know about the definition of indie music in india is anything that's not bollywood or classical so um indie music uh Never develop India. Never developed the same strict genreification mm -hmm. that is kind of so important to us. Um, and um, and this this scene is just um, it's 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 being supported by the people who are in it. <laughs> it's I guess it's like any independent scene when it first kind of comes out on the on the um, when it first kind of emerges but um young people that i've interviewed over the last six years have all said it's something that you that they want to get better at it's something that they um, believe is really going to grow because the youth culture is shifting so much and it's also um uh so you always are brain youth culture um okay sorry i'm having a moment uh, <laughs> um we can kind of no, skip into, I can't remember um, where we, we were can... going I'm so sorry Danny the indie movement oh yes I think yep. the main point I wanted to make was it could be anything jazz yeah. funk right. heavy metal rock pop um and it's a scene that the young people own and they're going to build it and they're going to grow it themselves mm -hmm. because at the moment there's really no scaffolding for that to I mean mm -hmm. labels are starting to labels are starting to creep in there the concept of managers and bookers is starting to emerge, but mm. again, saying, it's... And do they consume it in that kind of same lack of genre? Is it? Would you see lots of different styles of artists in one in one event? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, a good point. Uh, for example, the NH7 Festival, if you go onto their website, you'll see that, <laughs> that everything is possible at these festivals, right. anything from every type of genre of music to Indian classical music to musical theatre. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it just, it just seems to be a, a very eclectic mix of everything. But for me, for, for the interviews I've done with young people, the most important thing for them is not so much um, their Indianness or being thought of as exotic, but that their music is authentic. Mm. It's, um, it's, it's what they want to do and, um, and it's a personal um thing as opposed to trying to be something else or trying to be like somebody else. So when you when we take when we do this Indy 100 recording in India, everything we record is so different and unique mm. and interesting and yeah. Mm. Yes. And not hype, not necessarily hybrid, you know? Yeah. yeah. Not at all. <laughs> um so um wanted to have a quick little chat about about the Indian education system in terms of, you know, formal yeah. and non-formal training that happens in India? Sure, sure. Okay. Well, and I think um, I can see this time ticking away here. Um, yeah, look, um, in, in the schooling years, um, yeah, your private schools are probably going to have music programs to offer, but in the government schooling, the focus is always going to be on academics, music career orientation is not a thing um, in higher education you can study classical Indian classical music right up to doctoral level but anything to do with popular music education is offered in private in institutions um, which are usually accredited by universities outside of um, outside of India and usually a student can only kind of go to about a diploma level um, and then have to go abroad in order to finish a bachelor. Um, and they're really expensive. So um, these courses, and there's probably four or five really key institutions in India offering a kind of contemporary music education. Um, these courses are expensive. So they're really only accessible to people who can afford it. Mm. Yeah. How, and uh, can I just how much the, the project has evolved over time? Can you sort of talk us through how the how it's how you yeah, see it yeah. grow. Sure, sure. So, um, so Sonia invited us to the to the India Earth Exchange Conference. I got a little internal grant. We um, basically were guests that just came with our little template, and we set up in a hotel conference room at, in the middle of this India Earth Exchange Conference. Um, it was a bit like a fishbowl. Everybody, all the delegates could watch these bands being recorded by these Australian producers over a, over a couple of days. Um, it was a fascinating mm -hmm. couple of days. It was pretty hectic and high pace and, um, and lo logistically challenging, you know, setting up mobile recording in, in a not so um, <laughs> appropriate room. Um, but that wasn't the idea. The idea was that we were going to go there and... Um, yeah, we might make a great album, but we were going to do do that community practice building and really kind of form the, those bridging connections or that bridging capital with some really interesting new people to see what could kind of happen in the future. Mm. So, mm. Um, and that's kind of what happened. Mm. Is this a little video? Yeah. So Dan, this is that that the, first video. Very, yeah. This. Our very first year in the project. That's the goo. Yeah, yeah, tell me what to do. Yeah, we were really proud to, um, mm. to to come back to Australia and produce that, get that album out. And the QT, my QT students did all the, again, did all the kind of back end to get that album out. Um, and then uh, that was 2015 and 16 and 17. So from that very first trip, the wonderful thing was we met 
some partners who have now become really important QUT um, industry partners and, and um, university partners. Um, and we uh, talked about doing this project together. So the project evolved into happening at the KM Music Conservatory, um, led by Adam uh, Gregg from, uh, he's the academic coordinator. Indie 100 happened there um, with Australian and Indian producers, Australian and Indian students, Australian and Indian educators. Um, and and it, it was a really was a true collaboration. It moved from QUT, just showing people our, our thing, to it becoming its own kind of lovely mesh of two worlds, I guess. Here's a, a little bit of um, a promotional video that we created. So that's, that's KM Conservatory there. Yeah. In Chennai. And it, that school was built by A.R. Raymond. The Indie Earth Conference. Indie 100 is a project that started out of Queensland University of Technology in 2011. And it was an educational focus project where they are attempting to align educational models and the music industry. pitched a project uh, to QUT, they supported the idea, then um, I worked with um, EarthSync and with KM to, to put this project together and they're very excited to see um, us look at how we might go to en engage students and teachers and industry and musicians um, for a, you know, a healthy ongoing relationship. So. So you're seeing some of the conference there yeah, as well. So, yeah, and I guess it's an important point to bring up that the artists also get to showcase at the uh, conference, which is a really big tour part, mm. and why we get to them at the conference. And you can see all these young Indians are so highly engaged and craving for the knowledge and, and in connection the studio and network. For a short period network. of time and see if we can get 100 songs done in 100 hours. So that's where we called. It, that's why we called it um, Indie 100. So it was pretty fast-paced, four-hour sessions. Um, it was a good way for people to kind of collaborate, uh, and we'd have a series of recording rooms happening all at the same time. So usually three or four studios happening at once, and it was just a way of getting a lot of creative energy in one place, you know, or across a week. Such initiatives it makes it really. Easy for musicians who, who just don't want to work on films but also want to make their own music and project to the world, and I guess that makes it really special. I think it's a good platform to uh, showcase different genres of music. Um, and the different things that's happening around us and it's a great exposure for all of us who are involved in this project. Yeah, cool. Um, thanks, um, Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it uh, certainly over that period of 2016-17, um, became a much more collaborative approach. Mm. And yeah, and the um, really Australian students take take to that. Was, was, did the Australian students also grow over that time? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Danny, we we started to think about. Um, I mean, the higher education's agenda now is that students have an international experience that they um, learn into, you know, that they develop intercultural competency and they are global citizens. But for me, it also meant that let's take this student engagement model to the next level. Let's take it internationally and throw students into a music industry so completely foreign to their own. Um, and rather than approach it like a traditional study tour where you go and you sightsee and you kind of learn. This was about students um, jumping in um, straight into a professional, uh, 
project. So they had to hit the ground running. Mm. Um, so, so we expanded the project to become a study tour. And this has been able to keep the Indy 100 sustainable. So the first week, students will go and do creative collaborations. They'll write music with their Indian colleagues. They'll record music. The music business team will curate, you know, I think last year they curated six live shows across mm. Chennai. It's really challenging. These mm. my Australian students don't know any venue owners in India, um, <laughs> you know, and they had to learn how to communicate across cultural barriers and different kind of cult so cultural and social values. They had to learn different concepts of time. You know, one student commented that everything's always running late or things change at the last minute or, and, you know, they in, in post-travel questionnaires, students are talking about how they kind of shift. There was something, a shift within themselves mm. where they had to adjust their own expectations. Um, yeah, and, and so there were enormous growth um for, for the students not only that um the risk the risk taking i mean it's not like a study tour to new york <laughs> this is india it's hard you know even just crossing the road for the first time is is a really big deal and students mm -hmm. um <laughs> walk away feeling like they they made enormous progress in in their own world view and their own thinking but they make lifelong friendships as well. Um, and uh, exposure to different ways of doing creative practice really opens up doors for writing some really creative stuff. So a lot of the creative outputs we get um, are quite exciting. Um, so that's that's one element. And then, of course, the other element to the trip is the Indy 100, which happens in the second week. And my students, again, get to either act as session musicians or assistant producers um, or work on the music business back end of it. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an exhausting two weeks. I have to tell students to go and have a break <laughs> because they're so engaged and, yeah, it's, it's quite wonderful actually. That video was just put together by a student and I thought it really captured their experience, Any, everything from the food to the people that, they met to the live performances that they curated. Mm. Um, yeah, and there was such a lovely sharing of sharing of knowledge and um, musicianship. Um, yeah, amongst mm. the students, it was it's quite magnificent to watch. And it's two weeks, so it's highly compressed. <laughs> There's a lot to do, um, and I, and I think that um, that kind of intensive mode works really well because. <laughs> You, you just have no time to you you just got to jump in and actually a lot of students talked about in their questionnaires about how it changed their workflow okay. you know that it actually helped them to understand how to be more productive and how to get get to to the point a bit faster and yeah. um yeah so it has a lot of a lot of things going for it sure. um but it's not for everybody <laughs> this this particular um experience mm. Mm. yeah so um i guess uh we should probably before you know before it's midnight before it's <laughs> well, hang on it's way past midnight for you what am i talking about um <laughs> let, let's let's do, do a bit 4 of a <laughs> <laughs> let's do a bit of a wrap yeah. up and have a look at um uh there we go can you see that yeah i can see Ooh. it yay i i mean i kind of thought there were four key themes about about all of it really <laughs> from the high school to 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 the Indy 100 to India um exposure to new practices new audiences and new knowledge through this kind of sense of community um that it's an engagement model that could that's transferable I guess across lots of disciplines um and that what's what's important about it is it connects higher education with the local community um, and with industry. Um, the intercultural competency, I think, is a really big thing, um, preparing students for working in a diverse, complex world. And, you know, um, it's, students don't tend to think locally, any local scenes and locally anymore because they've grown up in this digital, globalised world. They actually 
expect and desire <laughs> to work internationally and um, across time zones and interculturally. So it's I, I really felt that was an important layer to add to the music industry learning. And um, obviously it's a 21st century learner approach. There's my teacher hat, authentic industry embedded collaborative and ultimately entrepreneurial. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. There's so much to cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's the old when you've got a really ambitious project. Where do you start? <laughs> I know. Um. Well, thank you. Thank you yeah, so much absolutely. for that. We're gonna um open things up to questions. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to um drop those into the chat. Although, like, we've only got a few today, so it'd be pretty fine if you just throw your microphone on and. And pop your camera on and just just yell something out if you're fine for that. I've, yell. Danny and I already have a few that we've, been, that we've been doing in the background the whole time. So. Yeah. <clears throat> and Dan, Dan, you've been on the um, on the uh, the India Indy one. You've been in the Indy one hundred and the India trip before, so I'm sure you could answer some questions as well if they come through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> been to two of the Indias and the Indy one hundred, which was rather fun. Um, yeah. I'll kick off if we're still, if no one's uh, ready yet. Um, you mentioned A.R. Rahman, uh, or sort of, and it was a little um, picture in one of the one of the films. Yeah. Why don't you tell, tell me a little bit more about about who they are and what what they mean to the to to, uh, to you and, and and to the project? Yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, the the KM Conservatory who we partnered with was founded by A.R. Rahman, yeah. and uh, I guess most of us on this side of the world would know him as the first um, Indian composer to win an Oscar for his soundtrack for Slumdog Millionaire. Mm, um, however, in India, he's renowned for not only uh, film music scores, but uh, he's written a music, a Broadway musical. He's um, uh, also really brought non-mainstream music to the front, forefront. And I guess what is really special about him is his obsession and his... Um, proficiency with music technology so whatever is the current trend he's on it and he's making sure that his own work uh, his own staff are working with the latest technology but yeah. also that his students at the KM Music Conservatory um, are, are really kind of developing those those um, important skills so that they're really up to date the yeah. other thing he's done is um which was he he really wanted to set up a school that gave students a broad education so they learn western classical music so they do all the hardcore theory and repertoire and music history and composition um but they also do studio production and double and electronic music and then they're given the space to to explore their own kind of artistic identity as well, which is really exciting. So they're a real presence in Chennai. Mm -hmm. um, AR also um, uh, took children out of poor areas, put violins and cellos in their hands, trained them and paid them seven days a week. And now he's got um, wonderful film, film studio orchestras um, to do the soundtrack work um, and they get, paid professional industry rates um, and those opportunities wouldn't have ever come to um, to young um, Indians living in, you know, below the poverty line. So um, that's quite an inspiring story. Anyone interested, it's, they're, they're called the Sunshine Orchestra um, mm. and they are amazing. So, yeah, check them out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah. So um, that's so AR. Can I come in with something? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Simon. Oh, look, I've got sunshine on me. It's, uh, it's <laughs> time of the evening when it comes in through the window. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I, what occurs to me is, uh, sorry, this sort of is almost like being the grumpy old git about this, but the the idea that um, everyone is equally engaged and everyone having getting the same from it. I mean, I'm, I, I sort of, you know, think about the way that when we do engaged group work, that 
you know, it's never everybody having fun and, it, you know, it's usually yeah. maybe 80%, maybe even more, but it's still, you know, what do you do with the people that aren't, either aren't participating or are feeling excluded or are being excluded by other people, mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever else is happening that, um, you know, the, the problem with the real world is that it's not fair and education yeah. is about being fair in, in you know, and op offering equal opportunities. So what, what, how do you, how do you deal with that in, in this sort of situation? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you're, you're so right, especially in, in the higher ed, um, you, you have a certain level of engagement. You have very different levels of engagement because students have very different backgrounds and things going on behind the scenes. So, um, for, to make this model work in higher ed, I ask every student to set a personal plan or a personal goal, uh, set of goals that's realistic for them and that's meaningful to them. And it, it some students' goals are, you know, this big and others are, I think I can manage this much. So, so we try to, I, I don't know, we try to sort of also take a, a fairly personal look and obviously there's always those issues with group work and you still get the odd email that so-and-so is not engaging and and uh we need this by this deadline and uh yeah it it is really complicated i guess um i guess it it for 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 the way that we run it we just try to a, a address every student's individual desires and goals as much as possible um the other I certainly uh, probably paint I probably paint the celebratory nature of a lot of this um and the you know especially um in my book as I was saying I have honesty boxes <laughs> all through it that kind of says this is all great but these elements are uh, these elements don't don't work or you have to watch you have to watch this um I found with the with the with this the high school students in particular, they became really clicky and really kind of, you know, they started to get pretty we're pretty good kind of attitude and and started to feel that others weren't being included. So we had to kind of design measures that would bring younger members into the group and um, give them legitimate opportunities to participate as well so it's not all easy at all and as long as we're thinking about that and we're conscious of that i think i think it's okay i think we're moving ahead but i, I don't know if i answered your question simon but um but yeah, yeah. It did. i mean and and i you know in 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 a, in a way the sort of answer to that is hard work isn't it it's the, yes you know yeah. um that's the that's the way that you do it is by noticing what's going wrong and putting it right and that and that means you know it's very kind of labor intensive as a teaching method well, the, the other thing that definitely, I like, very definitely labor intensive yeah but having having been on two of these this is not a you work from nine to five and then you go home week or two weeks this is a this is a 16 17 hour day for two weeks um and uh, for in my experience, it was like out um, having social drinks with the students as well, just keeping an eye on them, making sure everyone's okay. Um, I think when uh, you would have seen uh, Yanto Browning being interviewed before um, when he was talking about recording the students and the students referred to um, referred to Christina as mum, Yanto as dad and me as the uh, naughty uncle. So it was, it was just a case of um, the there there's a lot of um subtle teaching that's kind of going on in the background where you you're trying to stay out of the way of the students but you're also trying to make sure they stay out of the way themselves um you try you try and insert yourself a little bit in to deal with any potential click stuff um there's um some issues with some of the um you know occasionally some of the male indian students can be quite misogynist as well and the australian girls did not you know on occasions didn't take well to that at all so it's just that the the benefit we had at the time was that there was just staff everywhere 
so there was there was the ability for us to we were just there the whole time there was there was no it's not like a a standard education experience where you do your job then you go home and say please don't email me after 6 p.m um mm. which always works um they if this was a you are there 24 7 with the students you're staying in the same hotel as them you know what they're getting up to um we well, hope you do in the end <laughs> And um, um, and I was I was also going to to say that um, you know I'm also behind the scenes writing grant applications and trying to get funding for students who can't afford to go on a trip like this. So in our first year, all sixteen students received three thousand dollars each through um, New Colombo um, funding, um, and you know that that allowed uh, that was amazing. That really gave students who really wouldn't have been able to afford that an opportunity an opportunity um and then um we we also make sure that when we're selecting students for the tour we've got a really good gender balance um and that we support our students to go to india who um who may be transgender or um are concerned about what it means to go to india um worried about 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 their their identity in a in a very conservative environment so there's lots of things to consider but we also make sure that that as many students have access as possible mm. I, I have a question if i may um hi. my question mm -hmm. hi my question christina is kind of what happens next for your students or your participants in these things so whether it's um you know students who've come through these programs who are going on to the the real world or to uni after high school or the bands that are playing in these indie 100 things what what is kind of the trajectory there and what is that transition like for them now that you've done this a few years um what, yeah, what sure. there? um the high school i i actually did follow up interviews with the high school students and um all of them um surprisingly one moved into a professional music singer songwriter career the others chose the the music business or the creative industries path which was really interesting i've got um one student's kind of doing a lot of live music event management in nepal for example um so yeah so there's some really interesting stories from those years um the indie 100 bands yeah i mean a, a lot of them were just up just getting up and started some um have had amazing success um through the project um and uh and their streaming numbers have been crazy um others uh yeah others disbanded um students uh, we have quite a lovely success rate of students who go and work in the industry. Um, we've got quite a few students working in radio. Um, so yeah, we definitely do try to follow up as much as possible. With the India project, um, there are currently two collaborations that are still happening online via the friendships that were made on the trip. I mean, there's a, there's not, a lot of um you know happy endings but we've but there's some really key little things to kind of um pinpoint along the way mm. that's very cool thanks very much appreciate that yeah thanks all right well if there are there any other questions um i've got like i've got hi I've got one. hi, hi. Ah. i have a question Yay. I was just hi yeah that sounds cool uh, I was just wondering about the, um, the actual music genres and how going to India maybe changed the music that was created by them by the musicians um, that you had uh, by the Australian musicians both or... I suppose both yeah yeah um well I was just reading through some of the data that I'd, I'd collected and and a couple of things that really struck me were um Australian musicians were fascinated with the kind of thoughtful symbolic uh, <laughs> approaches that the Indian musicians took the time to really consider in their lyric writing and, and how that kind of matched up with the 
with what the music was that they were creating. And it really gave my students a sense of a different, a more spiritual perspective or something, yeah, yeah. which was quite interesting. Um, uh, yeah, others um, were fascinated by uh, Indian modes and, um, uh, and rhythms. Mm. And uh, you could see my students wanting to experiment with all of that Tabla. stuff. Yeah, so that was yeah. really, that was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and I think one of the big, the big things that my students get out of it is that they go and they just can't get over the work ethic. Yeah. <laughs> they just, they just yeah. come home so inspired um, and yeah. they go, wow, I didn't know you could achieve so much in a short period of time. <laughs> you know, yeah, here we are yeah. in our curriculum saying you, you you have to write two whole songs in one whole semester <laughs> and here they are like pumping out so much music in two weeks yeah 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 brilliant yeah. thank you so, yeah no it's yeah. very cool cheers. thanks simon thank you cheers just to add to that as well um having experienced it as a producer um the indian students were very different to the um to the australian students in that um, my experience with both UK and Australian students is that they tend to sit back a little bit and wait for someone to take the initiative. That does not happen in India at all. It's it's the exact opposite. You you kind of just they're going. They're, you know, any any time that I'm I'm working, I was working, there would be like anywhere up to about thirty students in there, just observing and asking me questions while I was trying to trying to record all the music as well so it's um it's a completely different experience as a record producer as well yeah definitely <laughs> all right i think the the only other one that i've got here is um is this just chennai or is it happening outside of chennai this sort of indie scene slash km conservatory thing yeah, the Chennai scene is definitely growing, but it certainly wasn't the scene. I mean, really everything was kind of happening in Delhi, like the real rock scene and the venues were opening up there um, and Mumbai, of course. But um, Chennai, like we've been going for six years, this would have been our sixth year. And um, it's every year we just can't believe the number of little venues that have popped up or the opportunities to, to do stuff. Like it's crazy. And I think... Um, having KM's presence in Chennai with this, you know, student numbers are just growing out of control there. I think it's really making a big difference on the way that scene is growing. Mm. So, um, yeah, but no, I mean, there are pockets of things happening everywhere. Obviously, you know, for example, Goa um, has a really strong electronic music scene and has one of the biggest festivals in the world there. So, yeah, it's... It's a really interesting place. We'd love to do Indie 100 in Mumbai um, at the, the new campus of KM. Um, but, yeah, things are just on hold at the moment. Um, yeah, everything's so, on hold at the yeah. moment. <laughs> the um, Yeah. yeah when, record, when I was recording Banat, she kept saying, you've got to come to Bombay as well and, and spend yeah. some time there. Um, it, yeah, it's uh, there's so much to do there. Yeah, it's certainly fascinating, rich, mm -hmm. wonderful place. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I suppose that that takes me to because I did a, a very kind of small scale version of this once, uh, taking a bunch of master students to um, to Poland, mm. and mm -hmm. the thing that we did was that we went, we kind of isolated ourselves. I mean, I brought musicians, I brought Polish musicians in. Um, and we recorded them and but i think it was I, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that that you're by going somewhere you're kind of making it more of a thing that they're also experiencing the place the chennai sort of scene if you like as well as just yeah. working this um doing this project I wonder yeah. how much you think that distracts from the the actual recording project that the kids are there going, wow, we could go out and hang out in Chennai rather than, you know, I mean, yeah. maybe hanging well, back because they want to be somewhere else rather than. <laughs> yeah, well, in interestingly, they don't want to. Ha they don't. They don't want to hang out in Chennai. They are uh, because 
everything that we do, work and social, involves music. Um, so, so yeah, anything social is also work and they're out um, curating events in venues around the place. Um, uh, the, oh, yeah, I think that the thing is that we've built this relationship that's over time that we can actually dump students into the actual nuts and bolts of it. So um, as opposed to being outsiders kind of coming in, um, we have enough of a relationship to actually come in and be welcomed into the into the scene um, and given legitimate particip legitimate participation, you know, to, to come in and go for it. Like here's all these venues and here's all these Australian students approaching them. And yeah, it's, 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 we're very in a really privileged situation, I think. Yeah. I mean, cause it's, it's a very, it's a very different thing to, to kind of create an isolated community where everything goes in on in a little hothouse as yeah. opposed to, to doing something where you're kind of exploring a bigger community together. That's that, those are two very different types of experience. Yeah. Did you deliberately Correct. choose that or, did, or was that just the way it happened? It started as a little hothouse and it certainly grew to, um, to embed students in the wider Chennai community so and and really engage with the wider community so it, it's deliberate definitely um we can every year we consider how we can continue to expand the experiences i guess and the students yeah. are super enthusiastic as well uh they they make really strong yeah. friendships really quickly in in india it's very hard to isolate yourself as well because the indian students are like Hey, let's be friends because um, they're they're really um, it's it's I cannot stress enough how sort of it's like a a culture full of wide open dreamers who want to meet new people who are are fascinated with everything um, and with a very big with a very intense work ethic while at the same time they're they're just you know they're taking our students and saying come and check out my house or like we'll go and we'll take you out for food and things like that so it does it mm. it can't it it's it's a hard thing to explain it's not like if you go to stockholm for example um and then you sort of end up at the royal college of music in stockholm and it's just it's wonderful there and you kind of sort of stay there whereas in india you just especially in chennai it's it's not um the part of chennai that the school is in is not exactly the nicest part of chennai either um it's and there's no city there's no there's no cent center it's it's chennai is very sprawled so um yeah it's it's quite an adventure sort of going oh we've got to go and play at this venue and it's an hour and a half north and you Lost. know it, it's quite quite crazy do you remember when, when we all went to the wrong place um oh, we, were done many to, <laughs> we were supposed to meet someone for for an after party at this bar but someone had called their house the same thing and put it on google maps and we all went to this house in the middle of nowhere um on dirt roads and then the the ubers dropped us off and went see you later and we're standing in this dirt road next to a cow um <laughs> looking at this house door with this house that's completely closed up and then this group of indian men walk up to us and go what are you doing here and we're like uh <laughs> we're looking for this place and they and then they just fell over laughing at us saying oh yeah well this guy's called their house that um so you need to go back into the city <laughs> i was probably very grumpy by this point um yeah yeah oh uh, yeah I, I, I go too far, but do you remember getting locked on the roof in that building? Yeah. <laughs> it's just weird things like we walked into a building and these guards with guns outside the building um, let us into the building and then they opened the key on the elevator and we said we're going to the rooftop um, restaurant because there's a roof, rooftop restaurant up there apparently and the building was under construction. Um, and then so he, he opened the door, keyed the elevator for us, sent us up to the roof. We got out the elevator door closed and he'd sent us to the roof not the rooftop restaurant the roof but the best part was because it was under construction 
there was no elevator button. It was just loose wires. Um, so yes, we had to figure out a... how to get off the roof. We uh, the work workplace health the health and safety risk assessment they have to do before we go um, is challenging. <laughs> but I was going I was I was going to say the first trip, um, Chennai was hit by the floods. A couple of million people were displaced, homeless. It was we spent we had this wonderful few days in Chennai. Next thing you know, we're trying to get a flight from the other side of India out of the country to get home because everything was completely flooded. It was just a, an absolute disaster. And that was, that was an amazing experience. And then the second year, um, the, they, they decided to do the demonetizing. Um, so there was no money. So you know, all the ATMs were closed. And uh, if you went to a bank, you're only allowed to get a certain amount of money out. And it was, it was again, another really super challenging time. And then the final, the next year, their um, much loved um, uh, political leader of Chennai um, had died and there was predicted riots going to happen on the streets and so on. So we were all, every time we're there, we're always ready for, for adventure, for, for adventure, and um, yeah, and preparing students for this is in the lead up is always really important because um, yeah, they most of them have never even travelled outside of Australia before, so um, yeah, it's a there's a, a a lot to consider. <laughs> to quote to quote Adam, he, uh, when it rained the first time I was in Chennai, he said, "Don't step in a puddle if it rains in Chennai because." the streets flood and what you think is in the water is in the water um <laughs> because there it's the garbage on the side of the streets the sewage just the raw sewage um, when the streets do flood you gotta be really careful where you walk there's there's a whole whole just layers and layers of things that are socially challenging for but the indian students are so wonderful they really support the australian students through through all these little challenges um they give them lots of advice and lots of assistance and yeah this and so the australian students just don't really get freaked out or faced by the adventure so it's 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 a wonderful community building exercise especially when you throw in some of these um kind of infrastructural obstacles and things as well hmm. cool well we've just we've just hit the seven thirty mark which means we're gonna have to Go and start getting prepared for the concerts. Excellent, so... and I might go to bed. <laughs> it's, it's up. It's up us four. <laughs> yeah. No, well, thanks very much to well to all three of you, but uh, particularly. Yeah. Thank you, Jan and Danny. <laughs> all right. I mean, you know, Danny managed to get here from San Francisco, so look at that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We got Sonia on the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Thanks a lot. And I, I'm going to start the, um, the the YouTube concert. And um, don't, don't forget the um, book launch on Thursday morning. Um, details are on the website or will be the on the Twitter. website tomorrow morning. And the Twitter listening party on Thursday evening, which again will be on the details will be on the website. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and um, play the concert. All right. Okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks Christina. Dan. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Simon. All right. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. All right. Concert time. <laughs>
Okay, sorry. Hey. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it. We're done. Um, uh, we've, we only have the, the one band playing this evening. And uh, thanks to, <laughs> well, in fact, Pedro and Juan Pablo, uh, because everyone else is a UWL person at the moment. So thanks for sticking it out to the end. And represent, represent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, hey, Pedro. Hi, Simon. Good to see you. I'm so sorry. Today's been a very complicated thing. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to see you and, and say thank you for putting all of this together. It's been great. Oh, no worries at all. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's still going on another six weeks of it. Yeah, no, five weeks of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll join the Twitter party on Thursday if you've got the time. Uh, um, Definitely. Uh, I'll put, I'll be, and they, there's a book launch as well on Thursday morning. But, um, right. And then uh, Stan Hawkins next week, and oh, and Friday afternoon, Alex. Oh shit! I didn't. That's what I didn't do. I didn't promote that. Um, Alex, you know, he does this um, kind of um, what's the word? The kind of um, survey of the week with various mostly postgrad students, but other people drop in as well. But he does a Zoom session on Fridays. So, um, yeah, cool. All right. Well, I'm going to um, have myself a glass of wine and um, get ready to launch the papers at 9.30. So um, uh, I still uh, haven't watched yours yet. Actually, I, haven't, I, I've, I think I've only seen about one or two so far. But yours is... Um, I can't even remember what yours is about now. Pedagogy of some kind. <laughs> oh yeah, M what, mine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, um, the student consumer hegemony. Um, okay. I'm I'm still talking about trust. It's it, it it. I'm still doing it. I've been doing it for ten years now. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Um, all right. Well, I am going to call this session to an end and. Um, have a little bit of a life. All right. I'll see you a lot later. Yes. Yeah. Good Thank to see you. Thank you very much, Simon. Thanks, Agatha, for being Cheers. there and doing stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.